this year. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and before we go any further, I would also like to acknowledge uh, that, um, although perhaps not physically, we are uh, certainly um, uh, spiritually uh, located, the Center for Korean Research, located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. A couple announcements before I introduce the speaker. Um, we do have a couple um, more talks coming up very soon. So next week already on Thursday, so not, it's not the usual Friday slot, but next Thursday, 5 p.m., um, Professor Kyung Hee Pyeon, uh, who's at the Fashion Institute of Technology, which is part of the SUNY system, She's going to talk about impression management of school uniform culture in Korea from colonial modernity to new Korean way. And then at the end of the month, February 26, which is a Friday, back to the usual Friday slot, another um, interesting talk about fashion by uh, Dr. Minji Kim, who's an independent scholar based in San Francisco on fashion history of Korea as a field of study. So February is dedicated to um, fashion. And um, if you come to one of those, I will tell you what's gonna happen in March uh, or you can watch our uh, website. So uh, let me then um, introduce Dr. Gina Kim. Uh, so Gina Kim uh, teaches at the University of Oregon she is a scholar of modern Korean literature and cultural history, also of comparative colonialisms. And I, I see that on her webpage at the University of Oregon, she also references Vietnam in there, uh, so, uh, which is very intriguing to me. Uh, some of the key words in terms of her work are intermediality, transmedia storytelling, uh, sound studies, popular fiction and popular culture and history of technology and literature. She um, did her graduate work, both MA and PhD at the University of Washington, sort of just down the road from us and up the road from her. Her first book uh, was called Urban Modernities in Colonial Korea and Taiwan. Um, and um, I should um, point out that she's in fact one of very few scholars uh, out there working in all three of Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Um, that book was published in a Brill series, the Brill series, East Asian Comparative Literature and Culture. Um, uh, and um, on that board, uh, um, Sir Veep Kadenica and Karen Thornber, who are probably the only other two people out there who work in all three of Chinese, Japanese, uh, and Korean uh, in their comparative work. And that book was a comparative study of modernist literature and culture um, in Seoul and Taipei during the Japanese colonial period. She has also co-edited um, an issue of the Journal of Korean Studies on intermedial aesthetics, which I think is getting us closer now to, her, to, to today's topic, um, which was about Korean literature, culture, and film. And she's working on a second uh, book project now. Um, and the tentative title for that is Sonic Narratives and Auditory Texts in Modern Korea. Uh, which does definitely get us close to today's talk. And the title is um, Creating the Chosun Wave, um, li uh, listening to the Yadam Boom on radio and stage in colonial Korea. So Gina, it's really great to have you uh, here, even if only um, virtually. Uh, the uh, floor is yours. I think you're going to share a PowerPoint. And so uh, just so everybody knows, uh, when we get to Q&A, uh, please just lob your questions into the chat. And then um, I'll be kind of feeding them to Gina. Um, uh, and, that, and that's sort of the way we will proceed. So again, thank you, Gina. And uh, it, it, uh, the floor is yours. You're muted. <laughs> there you Perfect. go. So thank you very much, Ross, for that introduction and inviting me to UBC uh, and uh, uh, to speak. And, and I thank also the Center for Korean Research for this opportunity. Although I would love to be at UBC, uh, Vancouver is one of my favorite cities. Um, 
it's unfortunate, but I am also very glad to be here virtually with you. Um, I will begin by, um, as Ross mentioned, the bulk of the presentation that I will be making is actually a part of a chapter for a book that I am currently working on. And it's tentatively titled um, Sonic Narratives and Auditory Texts in Colonial Korea from 1910 to 1945. Um, and this is partially, of course, derived from or a extension of my first book, which looked at uh, the building of Seoul and Taipei. It was a study of modernist literature, which was very much centered on visuality, the visual aspect of the city, the urban life, and of course, the way modernist writers dealt with and grappled with the growth of the city uh, most, uh, most interestingly in a visual way. Why I was doing this research and writing this book, what I noticed was the abundance of sound that was part of colonial Korea and colonial Taiwan, which was not being addressed properly and it was duly neglected. Thus, my second book project is centered around sound. And although sound production has um, been an essential component of literature and history in constructing knowledge of auditory cultures, and the ability to record um, has certainly become a very important part of modern culture, uh, it has been duly neglected. So for example, we know that in the late 19th century with Edison's invention of the phonograph and uh, Emil Berliner's invention of the gramophone, we have now an ability to preserve, record, and uh, listen to sound in a wholly different way. These inventions allowed live performances to be uh, played back to mass audiences at a later time and in different spaces thereby reorganizing the way sound became mediated by materialities of technology. Shortly after the introduction in the West, the gramophone was also introduced to East Asia. As early as 1899, as advertised in early Korean newspapers such as Hwangsang Shimun and Dongnip Shimun, uh, it showed uh, there were advertisements that lure people to come see this new talking machine. Likewise, by 1907, gramophone records were being sold in Korea, and the first Korean music performance was recorded by Columbia Records that same year. These duplicated records, however, faced steep competition with the invention of the radio and its ability to stream sound synchronously over a wider geographical space. When the first Korean radio station under the sign of JODK opened in 1926. What's more, the move from silent films to talkie films in 1936 further electrified the mimetic experience of hearing the source of the actual sound connected to the actual human image and other objects, thus further complicating human senses and perceptions of sound. By tracing the history and culture and technology of sound production, uh, this bigger study aims to work toward a new understanding of auditory histories and texts as they relate specifically to the forms of modern Korean literary production and political subjectivities of colonized writers and listeners and readers living under Japanese colonial rule, which I would characterize it as at once liberalizing and opening up new venues for cultural and artistic expressions, but also increasingly prohibitive in terms of what and how Koreans could express themselves due to various levels of repressive state and ideological apparatus actively in operation. The debates around what constituted modern ways of writing and reading surged along with, the, with and against this mediascape in colonial and global context. The professional Korean writers and intellectuals of this period could not easily escape from the big debates on the role of literature and the making of modern nation and culture. 
Though hopeful, the knowledge of the real limitations of expression in Korean language, both oral and written, and existing forms and genres engulf these writers. In particular, the tensions between writing modern literature with vernacular Korean alphabet and script hangul, and the continued dominance of kukangmun, mixed script writing, mounted along with the imposition of Japanese colonial education policy in implanting the Japanese language as the national language, while Korea was uh, under 35 years of official Japanese colonial rule. Furthermore, the practice of oral literature and performance collided with efforts to not only preserve their traditional forms and content, but also to modernize them. Korean intellectuals undertook various process of linguistic and literary modernization in their attempts to standardize, formulate, and safeguard Korean language practices and cultural practices. Indeed, in the early 20th century, Korean language and literature underwent transitional stages of all kinds while being saddled by the colonizers' language and foreign languages that animated the linguistic habitus of multiple registers. Yet literary modernization in Korea is seldom discussed in terms of sonic or sonic representations. The entrance of new sound media technology, such as a gramophone, film, radio, and the microphone, however, lay bare the important elements of speech, sound, and voice uh, to the growing debate on modernity and modern literature. I argued that these new technologies of sound production and conveyance allow Korean cultural producers and consumers to work to create a uh, quote, sonic imagination, which is a term I'm borrowing from Jonathan Stern of Korean language, literature and culture that underscore the vernacularization of Korean through making audible textual materialities, which I am then calling it, uh, calling auditory text. Um, the manuscript at the moment consists of five chapters and uh, each chapter uh, investigates a specifically, um, a genre, an emerging genre that is specifically connected to sound production. So I'm not going to go over this, but uh, there they are. and. Uh, Today, I will be talking about the fourth chapter on historical anecdotes or yadam. I want to, before talking about my methodology for this study, also think about um, problematizing Yi Guangsu's 1917 Mujang as the first modern Korean fiction and to think about how innovative and important as Yi Guangsu's work is in considering the origins of modern Korean fiction. I do wonder what kinds of transformations um, of modern Korean literature, especially narrative fiction, have undergone or would un uh, have undergone when a decade later, sound production, reproduction, broadcast, and amplification through radio broadcasting is launched. That is, how does one write for the listener how does one listen to literature and how does one study sound when there is no sound to listen to? My methodology uh, is still quite complicated and I still face many dilemmas. And one of the dilemmas of studying sound in the early 20th century colonial Korea is the absence of sound archive or the very limited number of materials available to actually listen to them today, despite and ironically, having the technology that afforded sound recordings and amplifications was pivotal in their creation. As Sadia Hartman's work on fugitive archives demonstrates, the absence of an archive is in itself the product and problem of colonialism and post-colonial societies that we study. In this way, the absence of the recorded materials in relation to the archives of existing written documents that this study takes up points to an instance of colonial nationalist elitist, elitist, elitist power. Thus, my premise is that literary texts are not only inscribed and read, but are also voiced for the readerly year. I explore this central premise from within the field of Korean literary studies, which has 
in my opinion, in the recent years, taking a sharp vision center turn, whereby sound has become an unduly neglected element of research and analysis. What I also noticed was that even in the study of poetry, in which sound traditionally has been treated as, a, as very important, I have noticed an interesting shift toward image and vision, which has come to be linked with, of course, rationality, science, and truth, whereas sound and voice are seen as ephemeral, contingent, and insecure. However, as Jonathan Stern succinctly puts it, sound is just as enduring, quote, artifact of the messy and political human sphere through which we can hear new stories, unquote. Therefore, to facilitate dialogue of the sonic across various literary and cultural media, I take up the idea of situated listening and the situated listener, who is presumed to share, recall, absorb, retrieve, and activate the knowledge of sounds in order to understand the given text. Here in my study, thus, analytic attention will be paid to the trajectories and repertories of prominent vocal, rhythmic and sonic configurations that are embedded and embodied in auditory text and serve to forge connections between seemingly disconnected registers. And I have been working on uh, um, this and organizing various panels, especially through the Modern Language Associations uh, since 2015 and uh, the Korean Language and Literature and Culture Forum, which I have been part of and I had chaired in um, in, in 2017, have been actively working on this question of sound, the sonic, and um, the voice. I also approach auditory texts through intermediality as a way to address the absence of sound, as, a, as also as a way to decolonize the study of modern literature from the teleology of Western modernity and modernism. In uh, Colonial Korea uh, and the writing of modern K Korean fiction existed with older intermedial, especially vernacular texts such as Yadam uh, and Sarhwa, et cetera, which will be, uh, and Yadam, which will be the topic of my talk today uh, from the Joseon dynasty uh, from 1392 to 1910. I argue that these older vernacular genres were held in tenuous relationship to new technologies of literary production, where the archetypical mode of performing narratives and interacting with the audience is configured by the constraints and possibilities opened up by sound technologies. I therefore find the idea of narratives across media or the concept of mediality or remediation helpful. However, as Marie Laurie Ryan has argued, narrative across media are also very much relational and thus goes beyond the mere act of conveyance or the product that is created. Intermediality uh, thus does not simply describe the relationship between written literary works and uh, sound technologies, but I argue that it serves as an integral interventionist strategy that colonial subjects used to voice themselves and to hear voices that were otherwise silenced uh, and inaudible or even unwritable. Thus, by placing sound, voice, listening, and hearing back into the textual analysis of the newly emergent genres, I will hope to illuminate the relationship between technological innovation, everyday life, literary production, and colonial hegemony. So now to the uh, bulk or the, the central topic, Yadam. What is Yadam? Uh, yadam is, I'm sure many of you know, is a compound word uh, consisting of Chinese characters, an official and talk, which can be translated in various ways in English uh, as anecdotes, as miscellany, or even um, historical romance I've seen, uh, or historical anecdotes. Um, I've also seen that uh, Korean scholars usually describe it as traditional popular literature that was also uh, that was derived from usually uh, unofficial history historical records opposed to the official court historic, historical records. Although Yadam as an oral and written literary genre has longer histories and origins that go back to the Joseon dynasty, what interests me in this study is its re-manifestation. 
through new media, such as newspapers, magazines, and especially radio broadcasting in the, uh, in the early 20th century. In particular, this chapter uh, demonstrates the relationship between Yadam as a prose narrative that has putative uh, oral origins and its remedialization through uh, the advent of the radio, as well as specialty magazines, which actively facilitate the reinventing of Chosun history, which I characterize here as Chosun wave, borrowing the name from the contemporary phenomenon called Korean wave or Hallyu, uh, in which Korean language and past history have become more popular, visible, and audible, often combining entertainment with history to serve a pedagogical and global nationalist purposes. So similar to the contemporary historical television drama or the very popular colonial period serialized historical novels, I argue that the modern Korean yadam during, written during the colonial period uh, rewrites and retells historical tales to be performed orally through the radio broadcasting can be characterized as what Susan Stewart calls a distressed genre, where she argues that the folk, the folkloric forms such as fairy tales, ballads, fables, uh, et cetera, were reproduced as an attempt to quote, invent a domain of authenticity. In this chapter and in this presentation, I hope to demonstrate how Shin jong -un, uh, modern Yadam closely engage in the politics of inventing authenticity, along with amplifying the relationship between the materialities of speech, sound, and writing by making Yadam an auditory text. So who is Shin jong -un and his text? Shin jong -un was born in 1889, although some other scholars have dated his birth year as 1902 and was taken to North Korea during the Korean War. Um, and as a result, we do not know the date of his death. His given name is Shin jong -woo, while chong -on, uh, chong on is the pen name he began using when he started becoming more active in Yadam writing and performance in the 1930s. And perhaps this is another reason for the confusion of his birth year. Shin, along with other leaders of the Yadam movement, such as Kim jin gu Yun Baek nam and Kim Dong-in, belongs to obviously a group of in intellectual elites who straddles both the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries. Despite Shin's participation and activities, he has not received as much attention from scholars in either the pre-Korean literary field the oral literature field, or especially modern Korean literature field. And I have chosen to analyze Shin's Yadam, not only because he has been understudied, but because his career in Yadam writing and performance began with the opening of the Korean language radio station in 1933. So a, a brief detour to give you some information about radio, uh, it was announced in 1931 that uh, there would be an opening of a second station and all Korean language station was in the plans. And in 1933, KBC station number two began broadcasting in Korea with more powerful transmitter. There was also a new kind of uh, radio set that was produced, the Neurodyne radio, which used a new technology that would get uh, to uh, dis dissipate and uh, get rid of many of the background noises. Before this, during the first six years of broadcasting, KBC practiced dual language policy where roughly 40% of the single day's broadcast program was in Korean and 60% in Japanese. The establishment of the all Korean language station did promote the pr proliferation of radio sales and broadcast subscriptions throughout the 1930s. And you can read about this, uh, about this through uh, the very important study that Michael Robinson has done on this topic. More importantly, uh, this station contributed to the development of Korean radio programs. While broadcasting technology was being advanced and expanded, one of the most crucial aspects of the success of radio listening continued to be its programming. 
Although the colonial regime made concerted efforts to use radio technology and programming to cement its cultural hegemony, Korean listeners did not always fall victim to the system of control or to assimilation strategies. This appears to be the case, especially after the establishment of a separate Korean language broadcasting station in 1933, where in which up to 16 hours of radio broadcasting filled with news, education, and entertainment were carried per day. Yadam was given prime time slots in the programming. It aired twice a day, uh, once at noon, and then also in the evening of between 8.30 and 9.30, usually for a th th uh, 20 to 30 minute time slot. Yadam broadcasting on the ra radio went hand in hand with publication of not just one, but two magazines devoted to Yadam in the 1930s. Uh, Wargan Yadam, edited by Yun Bek Nam, and Yadam, edited by Kim Dong In. It seems that uh, Shin's close relationship to Yun Bek Nam also afforded Shin to publish and contribute his original Yadam stories in both of these magazines, which were two of the most popular magazines published in the 1930s uh, in terms of print runs as well as the number of uh, sales. These three authors also published their own collection of Yadam stories in the 1930s. My story, uh, my study of Shin's Yadam is based on my analysis of his Shin jong Myung Myeong Yadam Chip, Collected Works of Shin, uh, Shin jong un which was published in 1938. Since sound recordings of Shin's Yadam performance are not extant, extant uh, I rely on uh, his written work. The seven works uh, were, that were collected in this volume were also most likely uh, pre uh, previously published in uh, earlier um, prints of the magazine Wargan Yadam and Yadam. And all the, unfortunately, I could not match up the titles uh, of what was here in the collective Collected, vo collected volume and the titles of the stories that he had published in Wargan Yadam and Yadam magazines. But what likely happened was that he, he would um, um, change, uh, change especially a title to make, of course, my research more difficult. But what it seems to be, what it did seem to happen was that the basic story remained pretty much the same based on um, uh, whether it was published in the magazine versus what it was published here. And I think Shin and the publisher Immunsa likely chose the works that were previously pub uh, published that were also most representative of Shin's writing, as well as those that were probably most well received by the audience and the readers. Furthermore, my choice of this particular collection is based on, um, on uh, my of course, own speculation that the works contained in this volume were likely radio broadcasted, if not stage performances. And I will talk a little bit more about that later when I do a close reading of the texts in, in, the, in the collective volume uh, to show why I think this was the case. Um, Shin had developed a, um, so these are the list of some radio broadcast schedules in which Shin had contributed. Uh, this, oh, no, these are, oh, these are Shin jong -un's Yadam radio broadcast schedule from uh, 1936 to December, 1937. So the full 1937 uh, in which he seems to have uh, broadcasted at least once or twice a month. And I'm not sure if this is the most comprehensive schedule, what I did was I did a, a um, search in the Joseon Ilbo and Tonga Ilbo newspaper archive uh, to see uh, what came up when I typed in a radio program, radio schedule, and Shin jong -un. So Shin had developed an exceptional reputation for his oral storytelling abilities, which was often reported in newspapers and magazines. So here is an example where um, someone named Yi Eun-sang wrote that his character, words, and actions were able to touch the hearts of the listeners and were meaningful 
Thus, when listening to his stories, one did not realize the passing of time, but only thought of how touching and meaningful the story was. And this was, uh, in, in, it was printed in the Yadam magazine, actually appraising Xinjiang on Myung Yadam Jip. Another example is Xinjiang on's Yadam is beyond comparison. Uh, whenever Xinjiang, whenever Chong On's broadcast is air, everyone from children to the elderly pay attention and have fun listening to it. It is also said that when listeners knew that Xin would be performing, they would request uh, the radio station and radio producers to extend the program time because his popularity, uh, which also showed his popularity. And because of his popularity, entrance fee to his Yadam performances, as one that you would see you see here in the slide, uh, commanded a higher price than other performers. And in this slide, in this newspaper report, there is a line from that report saying that um, the climatic point of his performance was such that listeners were wringing their hands in anticipation. So again, Xin Jiang Wan seems to have been a very popular performer who commanded a higher fee for his performance uh, and was in, uh, in demand. Yun Beng Nam, who was also considered to be a, a sensational performer himself, relayed that one of the reasons why he had recruited Shin to radio broadcasting was because Shin had a great voice. So now I want to uh, dig a little deeper and uh, uh, analyze some of the texts that are in uh, uh, the collected works of Shin Jong An. And here, I want, to, I want to demonstrate how Xinjiang was modern Yadam closely engaged uh, in the process or the politics of inventing authentic, authenticity, along with amplifying the relationship between the materialities of speech, sound, and writing by making Yadam um, an auditory text that opened up a threshold for articulating the possibility of a historical subjectivity. Xin's Yadam, um, derived its thrust from past events and biographies. They are much like recent popular historical TV dramas and films, such as Tejangum, Jewel in the Palace, about Joseon Dynasty Palace Cook, or uh, Kwang He, Wang Yi Den Namja, uh, a film about one of the only two disposed kings in Korean history. The kind of yadam that Shin wrote and performed were not so much different from these in that what I see is that he took small portions of uh, texts from both official histories, such as the Joseon Wangju Shilok or the Taejo Shilok, as well as unofficial history books like Tonggak, uh, Tonggak Chapki and the earlier Yadam collections, uh, one such as Tongya Hijib. Uh, th th this collection that Yi Wan Myung, who also put together other Yadam uh, collections like Kezo Yadam and Cheonggu Yadam. And using his imagination and storytelling writing skills, he produced his own Yadam. In my study, I'm less concerned and interested in determining to what extent Shin's Yadams were accurate depictions of historical events and figures. Uh, a long-standing debate that took place during the colonial period and even today regarding the accuracy of historical novels and historical um, films. Um, while I, I, I am less interested in doing this, I do acknowledge, of course, uh, the dangers of distort distorting historical uh, facts and uh, the distortion that can happen as a result of rewriting of histories. What interests me uh, about Shin's volume is the way he uses Yadam as a, as a form and mode for retelling and rewriting Joseon Dynasty history. The organization of this volume then is very telling of the way he is engaged in this project. He begins with the founding of the Joseon Dynasty by way of how Yi sung who would become King Tejo, received an auspicious message and a divine order that he would become a king. This Yadam is followed by stories of King Sejong, Sunjong, uh, as well. 
in the second and third story. While the next set of stories are not exactly based on the biographies of Joseon Dynasty monarchs, they are set during the times of successive Joseon Dynasty kings. Um, and they are mo they're about notable figures from the periods of Hyun Hyojong, Jungjong, and Myeongjong, and Sukjong. While one Yadam is set during the unified Shilla period, uh, it is a story, and it is a story from Samguk Sagi, and it is about a well, but it, uh, it is about a well-known Shilla scholar, Kang Su, who played an important role in solving a difficult letter sent by the Tang mission and ultimately helping to unify uh, three kings under the Shilla dynasty. So although that text seems a little bit out of place, it is still one that has been very popular uh, during the colonial period in rewriting, uh, in constructing of Yadam, uh, especially by figures like Kim Dong-in, who was very much interested in re, uh, revisiting and rewriting both Samguk Yusa and Samguk Saki. In short, uh, what Shin does in this volume is intentionally rewriting a history of Joseon dynasty, dynasty through Yadam that combines both official and unofficial histories. The implications of this work might be quite obvious to many of us who know that uh, he is writing during the Japanese colonial period. It's the latter half of the 1930s uh, when Japanese colonial government was increasingly moving toward assimilation policies with efforts to make Koreans into loyal Japanese subjects by tightening its control on education curriculum and prohibition of Korean language studies and Korean uh, history studies, and even Korean language usage. The Japanese textbooks portrayed uh, Korean history, culture, and people as subservient, derivative, and backward. Uh, on the other hand, the same textbooks also portray Koreans as filial, loyal, frugal, having uh, reverence for authority, um, which are considered to be treasured traditional values of Confucianism. In many ways, Shin seems to be reclaiming Korean history and the glories of the past through his Yadam collection that takes the listener through the early years of Joseon Dynasty from its founding and especially through the golden years of King Sejong and Sangjong, the era that is often labeled as the Renaissance, for it was during these periods that Hangul, the Korean vernacular script was invented, there was a promotion of science and technology, such as the invention of the uh, rain gauge, and of course the um, the issuance and the, the uh, of the complete code of law. The uh, what is it? The Kyungbuk Taejong, the national law, was also uh, issued and put into effect. So this is a very it's a very important time period, and Shin Jong On is intentionally taking up and collecting his stories that make a more coherent history of early period of Joseon Dynasty. We can also think about uh, temporality for colonized subjects like Shin and others. Uh, and uh, temporality for colonized subject was a space of both anxiety and uncertainty. As Janet Ho, a literary historian uh, writes, quote, living on the peninsula during the final decades of Japanese colonial occupation was fueled by the sense of a dis disappearing future and the struggle to imagine a transformed present, unquote. And in her recent study of Tongpe Naksong and Yadam in 18th century Joseon dynasty, Shine Park argues that Yadam writing was, quote, a site for constructing a new mode of vernacular belonging that not only charts the dynamic world of here and now, but also paints contemporary society using a written medium reflective of the very language of the here and now. And I am very struck by this, this idea of the here and now, because unlike the modernist writers of the colonial period, and unlike the Yadam writers of the 18th and 9th centuries, Yadam writers of the colonial period reach for the past, because the past seems safer, more familiar, and more knowable, thus reconstructing the then and there for the now. If Chosen Dynasty Yadam was a recording of orally circulating stories, then colonial Yadam are auditory texts of written past stories. Acting as a historian or an archivist by compiling, abridging, composing multiple texts from the past, 
Xin created a sense of everyday life of Joseon Dynasty that were both familiar and unknown for the listeners of the colonial period, thus endowing the listener with a sense of historical subjectivity and creating the Joseon way. Shin's Yadam collection opened up ways to handle the contradictions of Japanese assimilationist policies, which on the one hand exhorted, exhorted Korean people to become Japanese, but on the other hand, put in practice of discrimination. Yadam broadcast that attracted mass listeners and provided mass public education for Koreans who were still minorities in the Korean education system. Not only did Yadam, um, provide historical education and entertainment, but Shin's Yadam text and its form further consolidated language through sound and voice, especially spoken and sung words and the listening ear as central to his Yadam writing uh, and Yadam writing as auditory text for broadcasting and pro also probably for performance. Three elements are prominently present in Shin's text. There are his consistent and repetitive usage of the actual word sori, uh, which can be translated as sound, voice, or song, along with various references to sound heard and made, whether by animals, weather, plants, or other objects, and of course, voices, whether they're cries, laughter, or different tones of voices. And third, the trope of dreams where the dreamer is always hearing a sound or another voice who is giving oral instructions or prophecies is another component that is uh, consistent and repetitive in his text. Unfortunately, I do not have an exact count of the number of times the word sori is in the entire collection, but it was glaringly apparent that this was probably one of the most repeated, if not the most repeated word in his collection. Just within the first four pages of the first Yadam, um, titled Between Reality and Dream and Tejo's Dream, there are nine instances of the word Sori, and here I list it here. In addition to the repeated use of the word Sori and its compound forms, the opening scene, as well as the subsequent scenes throughout the story, uh, is keen on advancing the story through sound production. So it is through hearing a certain sound or being called uh, and through frequent dialogue between characters uh, that is almost uh, like an Elvis Costello dialogue that goes back and forth, as well as monologue that are uh, vocalized like a soliloquy is constantly present in all seven of his texts in this collection. So let's look at the, the, uh, the first opening scene of his first Yadam that, was, that, was, that is um, collected in this volume. And here, this is just my very uh, rough and first draft of the translation of the story's opening scene. And I will give you a minute for you to uh, take a look, read. Because um, uh, Li Shi Jung was so bothered by his dream, uh, and especially the loud cracking sound of the mirror, he decides to consult with a master dream interpreter who could ex explicate his dream. The master tells him that this actually is a demo, a great auspicious dream. So he goes on to explain that the sound of the, break, uh, the breaking mirror is actually a sign that uh, Li Shi Jun will accomplish his dreams or goals and thus serves as an announcement of uh, Li Shi Jun's uh, success being heard all over the earth. This kind of strategy that you see, that is the re reputation of this, uh, the word sori, uh, the use of uh, the uh, sound as a, a plot advancer to, to make to advance the story, as well as the use of uh, um, dream trope a motif, is something that appears in many of the stories in this collective volume. This strategy and style are very prominent, and moreover. Um, what I also notice is that sound is often used to mark time. And as I said earlier, 
uh, and dreams are constructed as spaces where not only images appear, but a clear sounds and voices enter to give specific directions to the dreamer uh, as a sign for what to expect. Human voice is also always marked, like uh, marking of time throughout the volume. And there are multiple ways that the voice are described and to advance the story. As in the first story where the servant is summoned, other stories use encounters and meetings between characters as a way to describe voices. For instance, in the second story, hearing the book of changes on the boulder under the moon, a palace scar with a urong chan moksuri finds a visitor wandering around the grounds in the dark night, leading him to confront the visitor who seems to possess a yongname koon moksuri, I guess a delicate accented voice of the southern of the, from the, of the Southern province. So this further leads the visitor who turns out to be a poor unrecognized scholar who decides to return to his home village to meet King Sejong, uh, who the poor scholar does not recognize but interacts only through conversation and dialogue and through voice. So voice is at the center in the, um, in, in the story of King Sejong who eventually awards him uh, the opportunity to take another civil service exam in which he was an expert in the Book of Changes. And um, to give just one last example uh, is that voice is at the center of the story, uh, the last story. And this is a story about the scholar Wu uh, Pyong Suk, a scholar who has a terrible voice and cannot sing for his life. He is not only described as an unattractive, but as a tone deaf uh, person at multiple levels, uh, not, not only physically, but also socially. And he is invited to uh, where a gathering where other scholars and famous Kisang plot to humiliate him by forcing him to sing. And after this experience, Wu is determined to learn to sing and devotes months of his life in training his voice so much so that one day he coughs up blood, a blood clot after which he was able to sing with the most clear, beautiful, resounding voice. And I think this is a very familiar uh, story, Yadam, uh, from uh, the past. And so the legend goes that Wu becomes a, a famed singer throughout the provinces and is known even today. So these are just uh, very few examples from the collection, uh, Shin Jong-un's uh, collective volume. But what is apparent from his collection is that he was specifically finding ways to write for the audio medium that will allow listeners to have a fuller sonic experience. Yadam allowed for multiple modalities of conveyance of stories from the past. And it also amplified uh, the multiple registers of languages to be voiced and heard through the radio. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gina. Um, so great, uh, very, um, this is excellent timing. We have a good uh, 20 minutes or, uh, or, or so, we, well, uh, even a little bit more, uh, usually go to about 6.15 or so for questions. Um, so um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, you're welcome to pop your questions in the chat, or if you don't mind, the I forgot to announce at the beginning, I mean, you heard the announcement that it's being recorded. So, um, but even if you do uh, sort of show your face and wish to pose your question personally, using your voice, a sonic question, um, that's fine uh, too. Uh, you won't be recorded. I believe it's just the, the hosts that are actually having their faces recorded. Um, but so yes, uh, would anybody like to ask the, the yes, Cedarbaugh. Well, I have some really basic questions that could maybe start off while other people are formulating much more complex questions. But I was really curious how much a collection like this would have cost and like if it would have been something that people would have collected as a remembrance of being able to hear one time being able to hear him on the radio or being able to go to his live performance. So, I mean, 
you know, obviously parallels with K-pop, I'm thinking about that kind of thing. And, and I was wondering if there were other descriptions of him as a performer other than him having a good voice. Like for example, the rooster crowing, is he good at making rooster voices? You know, like, is there, are there any like other descriptions of, you know, I mean, does he do multiple voices? Would he do the servant's voice differently than the master's voice? So I'm, I'm just wondering if there are some other, I guess, um, commentaries on him that get into more details also, so. Yes, thank you very much for that question. And this specific volume cost uh, 150 chon at, in 1938 when it was published. And I'm not sure what that would be equivalent to now, uh, but what seems, what I can see is that uh, Yoon Baek Nam's and Kim Dong In's collective volumes were only um, 70 chan. <laughs> so <laughs> I think Shin Jong-un's collection went for a higher price for some reason. Perhaps um, there were more stories contained in this volume uh, than uh, Kim Dong In's and uh, Yoon Baek Nam's. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but it seems that he had built up quite a reputation for being a superb performer and storyteller. And thus, whether it was in this collective volume or in the entrance fee, uh, he seems to have commanded a larger fee. Um, and the other question is also excellent. And there are in fact many uh, descriptions of Shin's performance, which I wasn't able to touch upon during this, this presentation. And they would say he has a, he's very, he pronounced, he has a, his pronunciation is very clear. Uh, what else does, do they say? There are um, descriptions of him saying that um, he has a knack for description uh, and he has, uh, he's able to, um, what is it? He has a toktikan ambyon, so he has a very unique <laughs> way of performing or speaking. Uh, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, and his uh, the way he 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 would tell stories would uh, cause listeners to, I think I said before in the other one, cry, but also there's one where people would laugh to the point where they're like bending down. So those are the kind of descriptions that I, I found in some of the reviews in the newspapers of the time in which they're, um, I guess, reviewing uh, his performance. And uh, um, I'm not sure what, uh, the other question is very, very provocative, whether or not this became a collectible, <laughs> right? I'm not sure this was, this is a text that was available at the National Library of Korea in a digitized form. So it was in the rare book collection. But what I also find interesting is that um, Shin continues to write Yadam, of course, during the war period in the 1940s, which are, very, it tends to be pro, pro Japan and pro war, which also gets him into trouble, like some of, like many of the other Korean colonial period writers. And then after liberation and before the Korean War, he actually publishes a couple other Yadam collections, which seem to be uh, more, uh, less, less seriously uh, treated or conceived than this one. I'm just, there's a couple things in chat here, uh, but they're, they're coming to me privately um, from, um, from Bruce Fulton here. Um, so uh, let me see if I can distill them here uh, while others formulate questions. Uh, Bruce is asking, he wonders whether written Yadam were for the educated, whereas radio 
Yadam would be for a general public since it airs at noon and after dinner. And also he's wondering if Shin jung -un was active in other kinds of performance like as a pyeonsa, like with you know narrating films. Um, and um, he points out that Shin jung -un is not listed in the Kunde Chakka Sajeon, which I think Kwon Young Min did. Um, does that mean that a Bang Song Chakka is not considered a writer? Um, and um, I would add there that I was just reading something where I think Yum Sang Sup actually explicitly sort of uh, looks down his nose at uh, this kind of genre uh, as sort of songmu, as, as something, you know, sort of vulgar. Yes, thank you, Bruce, for that question. Um, Shin jong -un, um is, yes, not included in many biographies of writers. And I speculate one, because he was a popular writer of popular texts like, like Yadam uh, and writing for the radio, but also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier that he was also part of the group of writers who wrote propaganda literature uh, during the war period. Um, and then of course he was taken to North Korea and then we don't really know what had happened to him afterwards. So I think that's, those are some of the reasons in which we don't see his biography prominently uh, included in some of these um, encyclopedias. Um, and then, Yum's, yes, um, there was definitely a, status difference <laughs> between elite writers, so-called elite writers uh, and popular writers and writers such as Yum Sang Sop in particular was very critical of writers like Shin Jong Won and also of course Kim Dong In who began to write for literature. He wrote radio novels as well as of course he became the editor of Yadam magazine. Uh, and they believe that, for example, I think one of the biggest criticism that they had was that these Yadam writers were not writing to not engage in the writing of the colonial realities of the time. And thus, uh, thus they were not, um, they were participating in the capitalist system of consuming literature. Uh, and thus, the, these were, of course, the big divide that had taken place between elite writers and the so-called popular writers. But what I find in my research in this book is that there are many crossovers that have happened uh, in that people like Cheman Sheik was also writing radio novels and radio, uh, radio plays and radio dramas. Um, and some critics have said, well, it's because during the late latter, especially during the latter period, these writers had to make a living and they had to really become professional writers. But at the same time, I, I might kind of push back on that as a primary reason and think that these writers were also wanting to carve out a different mode of communication and the popular literature was one of them. Uh, as far as who, uh, is who is listening, whether or not the written Yadam were being read by more adults and elite readers and uh, the uh, radio pangsung Yadam were being heard by the masses. I think, I mean, that in, in, a, some, in some ways that, that was also the case, uh, but I would hesitate to make such a, uh, such a clear distinction I think many people were at, in the colonial period listening to the radio and listening to Yadam stories. And people like Yun Beng Nam and Kim Dong In and Shin Jong An in particular were engaged in trying to trying to make uh, trying to use radio as a means to um, I guess as a means to educate or enlighten the masses. Uh, and that becomes very much visible or apparent, especially in the way that 
uh, the Yadam texts were written, right? It's all written in Hangul, but it doesn't mean everything's in Hangul. There are places where there are references to classical Chinese. There are many classical Chinese phrases that are included in this Yadam, but they're always annotated and explicated. And I think that serves as a, as a pedagogical tool, perhaps as a pedagogical way or means for these writers to try to not only, of course, as I said, rewrite the history of Joseon dynasty, but also as a way for the masses to be engaged in learning history and, and, and hearing history. There's another follow-up question here from Cedarbau. <laughs> Um, so we know that some of these Yadam performances were put on, on records, right? So do any uh, of his performances survive on records? Um, and um, how would a recording company decide or choose which Yadam performers, you know, to actually put out there on disc? Um, and if Shin was that popular, wouldn't they want to make a recording of him? And if so, are, you know, is such a thing extant or do we just not know? Yes, excellent question. And as of now, I think the only one surviving recording of Yadam is one by Yunbek Nam. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, there has not been one by Shin Jong -un. Uh, we have not been able to locate any by Shin Jong -un, which is again, I think your point is right on. If, if he was so popular and beloved, there must have been some recording, uh, of, a record recording, a gramophone recording of his performance, but it's it has not survived, or it's we don't know about it. It might be in private collection, and that's I think one of the one of the difficulties of working on this because I think there are places where private. Um, there are private holdings <laughs> of some of these texts and uh, recordings that might exist, but so far scholars have not been able to actually bring it together uh, into an archive in which we can actually have access to. Um, one, one thing, I, again, sort of on the same note, I, I've noticed in my poking around, I mean, that a sort of parallel situation with the market for antiquarian Korean books, you know, sort of pre 20th century, you know, printed books and manuscripts, they, they, there's a whole world of, of collectors out there. And there's a market for those the, these recordings, right, for these old records. And um, I've noticed there are some sort of compendia that list all of the titles, you know, and the contents of these records, and even a few websites where you, in theory, can actually, where they've uploaded, you know, they've, they've digitized. Um, but I find that they're actually very hard to, to work with. I don't know if you've tried working with those kinds of sites. Yes, so, and these sites are really frustrating because yeah. one, they're there one point and then they're taken down at another point. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's also a matter of the person who is unable to maintain the, the, the archive, the digital archive. And in some cases, they have been handed over to, for example, the National Library or the National Archives of Korea, but then it becomes also uh, difficult, especially for scholars who work abroad to have yeah. access to them. Yeah. Um, Cedar Bao has got another quick question. So weren't these, these records tended to last three to th three or 3.5 minutes, right? Yes. So was that enough time for a Yadam or I mean, would they have fit in that or? No, and I think it's also it's um, it's interesting because many of the yadam for radio broadcasts were about twenty minutes, and in fact, many of them actually became serialized yadam stories. So they would have one session one day, and then the same uh, the same story being told uh, the next part being told the next day. So it is it's much longer, but I think the recordings are only just a snippet of what we get from these performances. And then going back to Bruce's question about whether or not Shin jong -un has ever um, worked as a pyeonsa, I'm not sure. I haven't seen his name as a pyeonsa. And I think it's because his career came a little bit later uh, in the 1930s as a performer. 
uh, and recognized as a performer. Thus, I, I don't really see him as a, I, I haven't found him as working as a pensa, but it brings up an interesting point about how um, one of the ways that one might be able to approach this and to try to insert sound into these soundless texts <laughs> is to see and work with uh, colonial period films that have sound, right? And many times, and even up until the 50s and 60s, what we know is that many actors did not use their own voices mm. in recording their, their, the film um, in the post-production. It was the voice actors who were brought in to record the, the, the voices of the actors and actresses. So it could well be that some of these um, um, performance, Yadam performers were also, uh, could have been uh, Pyeongsas, but as of, at, at this moment, I do not know if Xinjiang was. Here's another question, uh, uh, anonymous. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Can you uh, perhaps talk about the audience of Yadam? Um, do you know who consumed these stories and their responses? Did the retelling of Chosun history change according to audience? And if uh, since since Jin un was active even after the colonial period, did his tellings of Yadam change after liberation? Mm, yes. Um, great question. Thank you. The audience, and again, based on, of course, collected reports and reviews from newspapers and Yadam and Work on Yadam magazines, we find that the readership and the listenership really varied from the very young to the elderly. And what, and the reason for that, and based on what I found in studying Xinjiang's collected stories is that at the basic level, the story is very easy to understand. One, even though because even though it takes place in the Joseon Dynasty, which is seems to be be, uh, be far removed from present time, it also seems to include uh, many allusions to classical uh, classical texts. What it does is actually to simplify those for the listener and the reader. Thus, I think is one of the reasons why it was so popular uh, during the colonial period, because for both the reader and for the listener, it was a way that history was being, being explained in a, in a simple, easy to understand and entertaining way. And I, I was um, revising and working on presenting this, I remember, um, the news that came through on uh, on one day um, regarding Sarmin Sok, I think is his name, the famous um, celebrity history teller or history lecturer, right? He became very famous because he had a program in, on EBS in which he lectured on history, Korean history. Uh, and I remember watching his program thinking, wow, you know, you're, you're kind of incorrect in that interpretation, <laughs> but he did it in such a, um, such a smooth and um, easy to understand way. I could see why both uh, adults who are wanting to get a refresher on Korean history, as well as young students, high school students who are studying for exams we uh, would go to his program to, to learn about Chosun Dynasty or the colonial period, et cetera. So I think um, both the written as well as the radio broadcast were accessible to all audiences. But I think what I, in, in my other work and my other chapter, what the argument that I make is that the radio uh, was broadcasted throughout the 1940s from late, even when the newspapers were shut down by the colonial government, it still aired these programs. So radio novels and Yadam were broadcasted through the radio. And I think 
It is because it was uh, in Korean and listeners can still listen in on these programs um, that it, it, it was sustained throughout even the war period. Um, I don't see any more questions in chat. Um, if I could ask a, a kind of selfishly motivated question. Uh, at the beginning, you talked about how writers were kind of wrestling with what a, what a modern written literary Korean language would look like, and you want to shift to the sonic and, and sort, uh, you know, yes, sonic texts. And it looks like you've collected a bunch of really good kind of meta commentary about these performances or about the, the sonic texts themselves. And this is right in the 1930s, especially moving into 1937, 38. This is when um, you've got Lee Tae-jun writing Munjang Kanghwa, um, where you've got Korean intellectuals and linguists or grammarians, I should say, kind of defining what it, you know, what the defining characteristic, unique features of the Korean language are and what makes it special and different from Japanese or better than Japanese. And the one thing that keeps coming up and which Lee Tae-jun is kind of responsible for making, you know, persist to this day is this idea that uh, Korean, our Korean is uniquely well positioned to convey and capture emotion um, and feeling. And then the, the word that the key word is ogam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the you know ono har ocha and kamjang har kam, um, which uh, is kind of a translation of German Sprachgefühl. Yeah, except that it's for the Koreans at this time, it's something that inheres in the language itself, not in speakers. Um, and so I'm wondering if in the common, the metalinguistic commentary you found, you find any specific uh, explicit um, appeals to this idea that uh, of affect and emotion and how these, these, these sonic texts through Korean and that Korean itself, the language itself is uniquely capable of conveying that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, excellent question. That's a very provocative idea and thought. And I think, yes, simply because in these um, newspaper reports, in addition to, of course, commenting on his the the, the performance and uh, the voice. Uh, it is also about the way that the audience were like what ringing their what was the like ringing their hands or right <laughs> they're like feeling uh, there's an act of affective reaction to the kind of performances that they're they're encountering so there's that and then also just thinking about Xinjiang's text on their own there are multiple cases in which, of course, Korean's uh, usage of onomatopoeia are considered- well, that, that was my next question, because then <laughs> it all comes down to Lee song -ah and Lee tae -ah. Yes. And, 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 it, and Lee Tae-jun has a long section on this in Munjang Kanghwa. And right in 1938 is when the, the linguists at the, the Hangul Hakwe are saying, look at our Lee song -ah, Lee tae -ah. it puts Japanese to shame. Uh, and, and then and they go off on this whole thing about how J Japanese is so impoverished in this way. Yes, so I think that's what I noticed in, a, in looking at his text, that in addition to, of course, all these different sounds um, that advances the story, it also has these components in which there are many, many um, like onomatopoeias uh, that are present in order to, in fact, enliven the story. Yeah. Uh, and thus, in some ways, I think, in, in many cases, I thought, especially in the story about the uh, Kisang, it reminded me of like um, Huang Jingyi's poetry, right? Huang Jingyi's Shijo, in the way that she is this masterful uh, writer of and And I think that's also very much apparent in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. And thus, this is where I want to think about how Yadam, Although it is at the, it belongs in the the sphere of popular literature, is very much engaged in the this, the larger discourse of what is modern literature. Modern literature. Excellent. Well, we're past six fifteen, um, so I think um, 
unless anybody's got a one last burning question that they have to ask before we finish. I don't see anything in chat. So unless you wanna turn on your camera and lob it in right now, it's kind of going once, going twice. Um, in which case I, I would like to, um, I'm sure I speak for everybody uh, in thanking Gina for a really fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really um, uh, exciting stuff. I look forward to seeing uh, the book. So thank you all uh, for coming. Um, and I hope to see uh, as many of you as possible uh, on, the, on February 4th um, next week, um, where we shift to fashion. And um, that concludes our session today. Thank you all for coming. And, and Gina, don't go away because there's a little bit of last minute bureaucracy to deal with. But again, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Gina, for a really interesting talk. Yes, thank you very much for coming and listening and all of your questions. <clears throat>